And welcome to Leading Forward, our summer speaker series. Um, we're thrilled that everyone is joining us tonight. And as I said in the chat, I know everyone has a lot of uh, choice, especially online right now. So we really appreciate you spending the next 45 minutes or so with us. Um, my name is Kate Treitman Brown. I am uh, the Director of Graduate Affairs and I graduated from Nobles in 1999. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists this evening. We have the entire library team and they are joined by Kim Neal from Communications. This evening is about sharing the resources that the, grad, that the library team put together um, about racial justice and anti-racism work. This originally was created for students, employees, parents, and guardians, and tonight we're excited to share it with the graduate community. We'll hear from our panelists and then we will have a Q&A session, but if you have a question, feel free to enter it into the question and answer box at any time. Um, so I'm gonna first introduce our panelists. Um, Heidi Charles is our archivist and librarian here at Nobles and she's been with us for a little bit over a year. Uh, Talia Sokol is the co-director of the library. She's been at Nobles for eight years. Ella Stein is librarian and she has been at Nobles for three years. And finally, Emily Trigert is the co-director of the library. She's been at Nobles for seven years. And as I mentioned, Kim Neal, who's the assistant director of communications, she's been at Nobles for nine years and she's also getting her master's in library science from Simmons University. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna start open-ended and ask you to tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing. 
Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, this talk is mostly going to be about the guide, but we want to situate the creation of this resource in the larger picture of what the library does. Our goal is to empower students, faculty, and staff with the tools and information to become more concerned, engaged citizens in and outside of Nobles. Um, nobles, uh, when in session, uh, can be a community that is fairly insular, um, where events in the outside world can feel far away and not relevant, especially to our most privileged community members. Nobles being closed isolates us from each other, but also allows greater internal reflection and examination of history and the current state of the world. It is important to us that both on campus and virtually, we try to open up the nobles bubble as much as possible to engage with the world around us. So we've been thinking about ways to further reinforce those face-to-face -face interactions and opportunities when we're back on campus. The guide that we created and we'll be speaking about today is just one of the ways that we're doing this work. Our ultimate goal is to make Nobles a safer and more inclusive place for students and all community members. Um, a few caveats to start with. We are librarians and curating and providing guidance for using resources is our specialty. However, this guide is not and should not be the only place or way this work is being done at Nobles. Um, also, and most importantly, no matter where you're coming from, learning is so, so important, but it does not replace action. Yes, we should learn, we need to learn, but we must also take action to create a more just and equitable society. Anti-racist is not an adjective you can just use to describe yourself. It must be a reflection and description of how you move through life and the power you have to affect the various circles you influence. It's an important thing to keep in mind as you approach the guide and as we talk about it tonight. Good to unmute. Thanks for that, Emily. Um, and I think that's a, a really important reminder and just a, a reminder to everyone in our graduate community that this summer, um, Kathy Hall has written and shared some of the other events that we have um, coming together as a community about some of these topics. So we hope that, especially after tonight, some of you do join those conversations that are later on this month and feel free to reach out to me at Graduate Affairs um, or reference some of the newsletters that were sent out in the last couple of weeks if you wanna learn more about that. Um, I'm gonna actually ask Kim, I know you've been involved in this work for a while and I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about the creation of this guide um, and some of the context for these resources. Sure, so several years ago, the librarians had created a smaller uh, guide of books and other resources around racial justice. And about two years ago, when I started my library coursework for Simmons, with the uh, input of Director of College of, of Counseling, excuse me, Jen Hamilton, I developed an online mental health and wellness resource guide for students and employees at Nobles. Since then, lib guides like that one have proven to be really useful for cultivating and sharing other resource collections online and supporting various academic and cultural goals at Nobles. So this past winter, there was a student-led Martin Luther King Day assembly. And following that assembly, I worked with Gabby Malave, who's the DEI teaching fellow and her whole DEI department to create a lib guide celebrating black history. And recognizing the need at that time to further support learning and awareness about anti-Black racism and racial justice, the librarians and I used that collection as a starting point for this more extensive racial justice resource for the Nobles community. Um, part, an important part of that was including health and wellness resources for our community members of color, specifically Black people. This racial re justice resource guide that we're talking about today includes suggestions from the DEI team, as well as from our students, faculty, staff, and thankfully graduates. This learning tool keeps evolving as we add and update resources from organizations and individuals with experience and authority in these areas. We turn to race and history scholars, writers, educators, policymakers and community organizers. We also intentionally include resources that address specific areas of concern we've heard from our own community members, especially students, whether through social media or internal conversations with the school. 
And as we continue to integrate these resources throughout the curriculum, we've included many of them across other Nobles projects, like this summer's reading list for students and the academic summer resource guide, which the librarians will share in more detail later. Yeah, thanks, Kim. That's a, that's a great overview. And I know we're going to sort of delve into each of those topics um, a bit more uh, with, with different people. So I'm going to pull up uh, the actual guide. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> um, All right, does that work? Give me a thumbs up if that worked. Um, all right, so this is actually the homepage um, of the guide and I'm hoping that one of you can, um, can walk us through the layout and some of the information. Uh, yeah, so this is our guide. Uh, you can find it at nobles.libguides.com slash racial justice. Um, and don't forget the HTTPS before. Um, it'll also be posted in the chat of the webinar um, and you can find it on our Nobles website, as well as the library website, which is currently down right now, but we're working on it right now. Um, and that is at lib.nobles.edu. So um, as Kate mentioned, this is the homepage of our guide. And on the homepage, we just have a brief welcome and we include tools and tips for how to navigate this guide if you don't know where to start. There is also a glossary from racial equity tools that you can use if you're going through this guide and you come across unfamiliar terms or phrases. So at the top, you'll see um, the menu of tabs with the different types of resources and information. So we're gonna navigate through each of these um, tabs. So Kate, could you advance to the next slide, please? Yes, I'm tr gonna try. <laughs> okay. Oh, the next slide after that. There we go. Okay. So um, on our books tab, you'll find a robust list of books that talk about racial justice. There are fiction, nonfiction, YA books, children's books, books by Black feminists, books specifically talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, books about whiteness and privilege, books about the legacy of slavery, and more topics included in the racial justice framework. So if you like to read, this is a great place to start. Um, our next tab is films and videos. And on that page, we share um, feature films and documentaries and short videos. Next slide, please. Next, we have um, our podcast tab. And these podcasts that we've included provide a variety of different perspectives and they discuss um, themes of racial justice, anti-racism, and the Black experience in America. Articles is our next tab, and similar to the books tab, this is another really robust list of both scholarly, editorial, and op-ed articles on a variety of topics within the racial justice framework. Next slide, please. Oh. Great. So, um, this page is specifically for parents and guardians, um, and the resources on this page can help parents discuss these topics with their children. Um, and also included in these resources are um, tools on how to raise anti-racist children. Um, in the educational resource tab, we have curated resources specifically to help educators in their work. So these resources can be used either in the classroom or to inform the work of the educator themselves. And it includes lesson plans, teaching materials, webinars, um, websites, and more. The social media page links to different social media accounts that you can follow or check out to learn more about Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, racial justice, and more. The DEI team tab includes um, or introduces you to the individuals in the DEI department and gives you information on how to get in touch with them. The action page is a collection of resources submitted by Nobles community members, which provides ways to support the racial justice work that is going on this summer. And lastly, the mental health and wellness page includes mental health and wellness resources by, about, and for Black folks. 
So that's our guide in a nutshell. It's also really important to note that this is a public guide that anyone is welcome to use. However, please be aware that unfortunately some of the information is behind paywalls. Okay, thank you so much, Heidi. It's a lot. And I, I know some of our grads have had a chance to dig into it already and some are probably seeing it for the first time. Um, so uh, Ella, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how to interact with it, um, whether you're starting off or just a good, a good place to start. Sure. Um, we'd say start with formats and topics that are useful to you. Um, so for example, if you're a podcast person, as Heidi said, we've included lots of podcasts. Or if you're a reader, we've provided lots of books and articles. Um, but please also stretch yourself to topics and voices and ideas that may challenge your existing ideas and perspectives. Uh, one of our primary goals with this work is to connect people with voices and ideas that they don't already know. Um, and the, voice, the resources are here to help people educate themselves so they can take action and make changes in their daily lives and relationships. Awesome. Thank you, Ella. Um, and I know uh, you have mentioned that it's constantly changing, that grads can submit things, that um, there's other resources that you're becoming aware of. Um, how important is that, that, that the guide doesn't remain static, that it is this sort of evolving thing? Why, you know, in another way, you could just sort of put it together, publish it, and, and send it out. Um, is it important that it, it's updating? Yeah, it's really important um, that as we move forward in conversations about racial justice and equity to recognize that this work never ends. Um, as we learn more and are exposed to more books, articles, ideas, etc., cetera, uh, we're going to continue adding them to this resource. We added a couple things today. Um, and to that end, we welcome suggestions of resource, uh, resources to review for inclusion. So you can email us at library at nobles.edu or you can DM us on Instagram at Nobles Library. Um, if you get in touch with us uh, and are willing to include your name in your graduation year, that would be really awesome. That's great, Talia, thank you. I know some people will probably um, take advantage. I'm just gonna put that right in the chat so that people have that email address um, on hand. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to uh, sort of zoom up to a, a larger view um, now that we've seen the guide and, and have a sense of what's in it. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the values that you, that you had in mind when you were creating the guide, when you were putting together the resources? Um, what were some of the things that you wanted to make sure you, you sort of uh, focused on? Or Yeah, that, yeah. So I think... There, I totally understand what you mean. Um, I think there are a few, a few major values that we brought to this. Um, and the first thing when we were talking about creating it that we thought of, which is something that we also bring to the rest of our library work, is that we wanted to try for a balance of many different voices, ideas, interests, and formats so that we could better serve our whole community um, rather than just sort of a narrow, a narrow view. We also um, tried really hard to bring an intersectional lens to this, meaning that we wanted to address the concerns of a variety of community members um, who hold a number of identities, like we all do. Um, ev you know, everyone in the community, educators, parents, guardians, um, students, uh, graduates, and also people of many different personal identities, um, race, age, gender, ability, sexuality, and of course, many, many more. Um, this was really, really important to us in collecting the resources to, again, not just have one approach or lens. Um, we also, along those same lines, wanted to make sure to include resources in many different formats so that people could learn in a variety of ways based on their preference, based on the time they have, um, and also based on the fact that different formats allow us to approach the same concepts in different ways. Um, you know, watching a, a film is a completely different experience than listening to a long form podcast or reading a book or reading a couple articles. Um, so that was, that was really important to us to have people be able to approach this from different formats and different angles. Um, and I'd say the last, the last thing that we were, we really talked about um, in the beginning was to raise up black voices within this guide. Um, obviously the, the title of the guide is, is racial justice resources, but the 
guide has a special focus on racial justice for black folks. So we had tried to include as many resources created by, and in some case, cases um, intended for black folks as, as we possibly could. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. I think that's just helpful for people to, to understand that context a little bit better. Um, I'm going to sort of swing over to another set of questions, um, which is that I think a lot of people are also interested in some of the larger work that the library does and how um, this guide fits into that larger work. Um, but I also know that some people, some of our grads on might not know that we have it archives, have an archivist. Um, and I'm going to ask Heidi, who's part of the library team and the archives, um, to share with us a little bit about your work, you know, in general, and then maybe more specifically uh, in the guide. Yeah, so um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Noble and Greeno School archives, it was founded 10 years ago with the goal of preserving Noble's history. Uh, the archives holds records, photographs, and artifacts from the school's founding in 1866 uh, to the present. And the archives collections include the papers from past heads of schools, deans, academic departments, administrative offices, and student organizations, in addition to various nobles publications and personal papers from nobles faculty, staff, and graduates. Um, so as Kate mentioned earlier in the introductions, I just started as the archivist this year. So a lot of my time this year was spent doing a thorough inventory um, and examination of what already exists in the archives, where some of the gaps lie and trying to understand why those gaps exist. What I've noticed um, is that the collecting focus of my predecessor largely relied on material related to earlier years of Noble and Greeno School with an emphasis on George W. Cobb Noble and James Greeno. While all of that is important to our history, there are huge gaps within the collection just regarding the representation of a more modern day nobles. Um, and so there is a noticeable absence of voices and narratives of marginalized individuals within our community. And this is something that um, my collecting scope aims to address. And I've been building a foundation on which to work with other departments at Noble, such as the DEI team, grad affairs, and communications to fill in these gaps and create a collection that is more repre representative of Noble's. Additionally, um, I'm pl I plan on working on an oral history project that will aim to capture the voices and narratives of Noble's community members who may not have been represented, represented in the archives before. And again, we'll be working with departments such as the DEI team to inform this work. So um, with all that being said, I'm also accepting archival donations and would love to collect from any of you, photographs, scrapbooks, artifacts, personal papers, or anything else you wish to donate to the archives that is representative of your time and experience at Nobles. I would also like to take this time to thank any of you who have already donated material to the archives, and I really appreciate your contributions. Um, so I'm happy to have a discussion with anyone who's interested in talking about their material. Um, you can reach out to me by email at heidi.org. Heidi underscore Charles at nobles.edu. Awesome. Thanks, Heidi. It's a lot to accomplish in, in just 10 years. And then we're so lucky that you've taken this on. Um, and I know probably a lot of grads are going to search their homes over the next few months. So, um, and, and as, as Heidi said, I'll just echo people who have already uh, passed on things that they think are important to the history of Nobles. Um, so for the rest of the librarians, for Emily, for Ella, and for Talia, um, can you, sort of the same question, how does this guide fit into the larger work that you're doing? Um, and, and just share some of that, that work in general, sort of an inside peek to the library. Sure, um, yeah, I'm happy to start and then pass it on to Talia and Ella. Um, so like Kim said earlier, we didn't create this guide in a vacuum. We consider this work, um, so racial justice work, DEI work, to be an essential part of our library work. 
Um, and you know, while we're imperfect, we keep trying, we mess up sometimes, we learn, we try again, and it's kind of an endless process um, of incorporating that work into the library. So um, one of the major areas that we focus on in the library is academic support for faculty and students. Um, we teach library and research skills to students across disciplines and in all grades. We collaborate with teachers to support them and their, um, their students with research. We consult on curriculum and, and a lot more. Um, we try to bring a racial justice lens to all of this work. Um, I can give you a few examples. So, one example is one of our biggest projects every year is the U.S. History Research Paper. Um, this year, we worked with U.S. History teachers to create a big, a very long resource um, of topic ideas for students that brings up many, many topics that students may not have known about or may not have considered before as topics for their papers. Um, many of these topics are about the history of marginalized groups in the U.S. and our hope was that the resource would allow students to delve deeper into those stories through writing about those topics in their in their research papers. And we actually did see an increase this year in students choosing to write about some of the topics that we had suggested in this document. Um, we also another example is is our um, curricular work with teachers across disciplines. We often help teachers um, out with thinking about new or different resources for their curricula and we always approach this as an opportunity to help those teachers bring a greater diversity of voices and stories to their classes. Um, another opportunity we have to do this work is in the upper school um, summer reading program, which we um, organize along with Shannon Clark in the English department. We're very cognizant of offering a diverse list of books for students to choose from as their required book every year and we also um, are very cognizant of creating diverse choice lists. So lists of books for students to consider potentially reading um, over the summer if they would like to do so. Um, and then another summer um, activity that we, that we do, speaking of the summer, is a, um, the summer resources guide that we made this year. This year we worked with um, department heads to create lists of resources for students to explore over the summer in different disciplines. Um, we were able to use actually some of the resources from this racial justice guide uh, in that summer resources guide. And we also made sure that the guide was very intentionally diverse in a variety of ways, even in departments where you may not think that it's that easy to do, such as math. Um, these are these are just a couple examples of the ways that we bring racial justice and DEI work more generally to the academic side of our jobs. And of course, we're always looking to do better in that and, and all areas. Um, so that's kind of the, a brief overview of the academic side. And I'm gonna pass it on to Ella and Talia and they can talk more about the operational and programming side of the library. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah. So in addition to incorporating these principles in the curriculum, we also try to incorporate them into what we think about as library operations and programming. Um, and this includes things like displays in the library, the development of our print collection, and the way we do readers advisory or recommend books to patrons. Um, this year during Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month, Native American Heritage Month and Black History Month, we worked closely with the DEI department um, to create displays that were part of larger programming within the DEI department, um, looking to go beyond the idea of, of holidays and heroes. Um, during Native American Heritage Month, for example, our display in the library featured contemporary Native American and, and indigenous artists and activists. We worked closely with Ms. Kelly, who spoke in assembly, and we also helped with a community showing of Dawnland. Um, and during Black History Month, we created three displays featuring Afrofuturism, student protest movements, and young adult literature written by Black authors. Uh, in terms of our print collection, um, when we buy books, we try to think about who is telling the story and who is being represented on the page. And we purchase books that represent many voices. When we buy books, we also try to do the majority of our purchasing from local independent bookstores, including Frugal Bookstore, a Black-owned bookstore in Boston. 
since we've been closed um, this spring and less able to see our patrons in person, we've also been working on creating many book lists, including titles for this racial justice guide, lists for Asian and Pacific Islander American Heritage Month, a queer book list for the Pride Month, um, the summer reading lists for middle and upper school and the subject specific titles for our upper school summer resource guide that Emily mentioned. Uh, and most recently, a list of diverse picture book recommendations, which is uh, now linked to the Parents and Guardians tab of the Racial Justice Guide. Um, and Talia is going to speak a little bit more about um, recommending books. Thanks, Ella. Um, when we recommend books and create displays, uh, we try to follow the principle first described by Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop of providing books that can be uh, windows and or mirrors for our readers. Windows in the sense that they provide a view into a world that the reader may not be familiar with, thus allowing the reader um, to learn about identities and experiences that differ from their own. And mirrors in the sense that they can reflect the lives of our readers as well providing them with the validation that their identities and their experiences matter. If the only media, books, movies, et cetera, that a person is exposed to show the perspective of the oppressor or whoever is the dominant voice in society, then anyone who has an identity that is marginalized by society might not feel valuable or validated. It's extremely important to us that the books we display and recommend reflect and speak to a variety of experience and voices, especially those that exist at multiple intersections of oppression. Um, for example, in a display about romance novels, we make sure that we include multiple books that would focus on the experience of like Black queer people. Additionally, we also try to bring a DEI lens in how we plan um, our programming while thinking about things like book clubs, author visits, and lots more. Awesome. Thank you so much, Talia. Um, it's a lot that we've discovered in, in uh, sort of a, a short time. Um, and I know I'm particularly excited with a, a two and a half year old and a one year old at home um, to hear about the addition, the new addition of books for children, picture books. Um, so I wonder if um, you can, if one of the panelists can include that in the chat, if that's possible. Um, yeah, I just put it in there. Awesome. So just a reminder, um, as people uh, do have questions to go ahead um, and put them in the chat. We have a couple here. Um, one is just if anyone's comfortable, if there's a particular resource that you came across when creating the guide or that's been recommended to you that sort of personally pushed you um, or provided a different perspective that you were unaware of um, before. Anyone's comfortable answering that? Um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, there are a lot of different things that we've included on this guide that I've been looking at sort of over the course of the uh, summer and as we were creating it. I think, you know, as important it is, as it is for us as the library staff uh, to put out uh, these resources for the community, it's equally as important um, that we're engaging with them ourselves, um, especially those of us um, in the library department that are coming um, from backgrounds of, you know, a rhetoric that are white. And so we need to be engaging with this material as well so that we can be learning. Um, so a lot of it that I've been reading has been uh, articles and stuff about curriculum and how the experiences of um, Black and Indigenous people of color have had in school and what it's been like um, and how the school has failed them. And so reading about that and thinking about the ways that we can reframe curriculum has been really valuable for me. Um, additionally, looking at a lot of the social media accounts of activists, especially uh, Black disabled activists has been really powerful for me. And I've been listening to a lot of podcasts specifically along those intersections of identity. Um, so that's been an area where I've been exploring a lot more and learning from a lot. Yeah, that's great, Talia. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we, we just got a question actually, um, I'm just answering a little bit out of order, so I'm sorry if uh, I'll, we'll get to all the questions. Um, but one of the questions was about faculty and, um, and community and what sort of required books or um, uh, resources are being provided for the whole community. Um, are there specific things or specific titles? No, I know the answer to this, but I'll let somebody else answer. Um, would anyone like to? Are you talking about specific requirements? Oh, I see. Yeah, so there's di different opportunities for um, people to engage in different ways. Uh, there's 
book groups that had been offered this summer for faculty um, and staff where we're, we have the option to read uh, a variety of different texts and have discussions. Um, I think thinking about curriculum, you know, is obviously a larger scope than what just the library does. I mean, we try to embed sort of all of this work into everything that we do when we're assisting teachers uh, with their curriculum. And I think there's a larger um, sort of development in process of having teachers think about their curriculum and what they're teaching and whose voices are being heard and whose voices aren't being heard. Um, and I don't know if it's optional or opt in. Um, I'm just looking at the question, but I think that that's something that the DEI department has been working on really strongly and that we'll have sort of more clarity around in the coming weeks. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that that was not an optional thing for faculty this year was um, we worked with Facing History and Ourselves, which is an organization actually um, that is uh, that talks that they do a lot of work around education around um, about his using history to talk about social justice and racial justice and the faculty had two mandatory um, day long trainings with them and we were supposed to have a third um, in the spring, which I think will hopefully be happening next year. Um, so while there is a lot of opt-in kind of optional things for faculty, um, including those book groups, there's also a um, discussion group for um, anti-racist white educators or those who are trying to learn more about anti-racism. Um, the, the big commitment we made this year was, was to those conversations with Facing History. And I, again, like Talia said, I can't really speak to what else is going on, but that's sort of what we experienced this year. Yeah, and I'll just add um, for, for Kim and I, from the staff perspective, the staff were also included in those Facing History conversations, which was really valuable, um, even though we don't work directly, or I don't work directly with students, um, still it's, it's a really important value of our, uh, within our community. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question, um, and there have been a lot of stories that students and graduates have shared uh, through a variety of medium, um, social media, some of the internal conversations that we've had and hosted um, at Nobles with administration. Um, and the question is actually for Heidi about um, those stories and how those stories are being uh, saved and, and or if they're being archived. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a really great question. Um, so the stories that have you've been seeing on Instagram, they are being archived. Um, but also I'm working on developing a um, oral history project, I think I mentioned before, um, in collaboration with other people in the DEI department that will offer um, a more uh, nuanced and like holistic view of um, the uh, marginalized individuals um, of the nobles communities that their voices have not been shared or uh, represented before in the archives. So yes, yeah, so all of that is in the works. Awesome, thank you. Um, and there was also uh, one question about sharing this guide and um, and sharing the resource and. Um, I'm going to actually add on to that about the idea of this as, as a public resource. I think Talia, you mentioned that. Um, uh, why did we choose, why did you, we, you choose to make this a public resource and, and do we want people to share it? <laughs> I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, we, I mean, we made it public so that our community could, could see it, but also, you know, one of the things that we do as librarians is share information and we don't want to hoard it just for the nobles community. So yes, please feel free to share this, share parts of it. Um, you know, we, we've actually um, talked to other librarians at other schools who've, who've asked if they can use it or use parts of it for, for their guides that they're working on. And we said, absolutely, because the more people who are able to access these resources, the better. Does anyone else have anything to add about that? Just a reminder that some of the things are behind a paywall, but if you have questions about accessing any of the resources, you can definitely email us. You know, we can help you figure out if your local public library has it or where a good place to get a book might be or, you know, how you can access some of these articles um, through, you know, the Boston Public Library as well. So if you have any questions about specific stuff that you're interested um, in reading or viewing, just definitely reach out to us and we can help you with that. 
Also, just to add to what Emily and Talia were saying and what Heidi and Ella said earlier, this is a, a living, breathing guide that will continue to grow. So we hope it's something that you'll all share, but also engage in over time and come back and visit, see what new information has been added and um, use, it, use it with your own families and friends and um, your own growth and development. Thank you. Awesome. And um, we have one more question that was answered to a certain extent in the presentation. I know, um, Emily, you talked about the U.S. History Project um, and some of the other ways uh, that, that it is connected. I do see a couple of hands up. Just a reminder, if you can um, chat your questions in the Q&A box, if possible. Um, but sorry, getting back to the question. Um, if there are other ways that um, the nobles, specifically history curriculum, um, is has sort of changed and adapted um, using some of these resources and also possibly in other ways over the last few years that you've all been involved with. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? My internet is unstable where I am. And it kind no, that's okay, and I interrupted myself. Um, so the question is about um, the ways that the curriculum, specifically the history curriculum, you know, for those of us who went to school in the 90s, for me or before, um, or even in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, as things have changed, sort of how has the curriculum um, adapted and changed um, uh, with some of these resources becoming more available um, or even being created? Um, so I, I mean, I can answer it just from the perspective of, you know, having been at Nobles now um, for eight years, I have seen, you know, a significant amount of change in what we're teaching and what we're learning about in the time that I've been here, but I think there's always more that we can be doing. I mean, 100%, if you look at a lot of the testimony from students, um, it talks about the curriculum and how the curriculum makes them feel, you know, either not represented or invalidated or not valuable. And so I think it's really important um, that as we're going through this, as we're going forward, um, that we're thinking about all the ways that we can raise up the marginalized voices in our curriculum, both in history, but also in all aspects of our curriculum. I think if you look at the um, summer resources that we created, you can see it goes through a lot of different disciplines and there's a lot of ways that every discipline can um, incorporate marginalized voices. Um, and I just think for our teachers and nobles, there's a wealth of resources on the educational resources tab of the racial justice resource that we're talking about. And so what we have to do is we have to engage with them, right? It's not enough to just kind of see it and look at it and say, okay, here it is. And maybe read one or two things like we as educators have to be engaging with this as part of our practice and how we can take what we're learning and what we're reading and change what we're doing in the classroom. So I can't speak for every teacher at nobles only for our, my Myself and to some degree for our department and saying that this is something that we intend to keep working on with teachers and to make sure um, that our teachers are thinking about this um, as they're thinking about what they want to do in the classroom. Yeah, and Talia, I think Talia makes a really good point that we, we can only really speak to what we are doing in the library, but I know that <clears throat> it's something like I talked about that we're kind of consistently thinking about in our own library lessons and our own library work um, with collaborating with teachers on curriculum or on research. Um, I know Talia has actually developed a really amazing lesson with the um, this classic science um, faculty over the last few years where they look at um, categorization and classification. So they talk about scientific classification, but they actually um, classify books into different um, categories. And we talk about the Dewey Decimal System, which actually, if you don't know anything about the Dewey Decimal System, it's actually pretty bigoted. Um, and so they talk about a lot of um, those issues and about how classification gives power to the people who are classifying to make some things um, you know, sort of, to sort of raise up some things and not raise up others. So I think we are also trying to be really creative in the ways that we collaborate with teachers to, um, to the extent that we can to do that work. That's great. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, and thank you to all of you. I'm noticing the time I can actually. That was so much we packed into the last 45 minutes. Um, a reminder to, um, Feel free to get in touch with any of the librarians, um, get in touch with Graduate Affairs. We do have a, uh, the next summer session um, is next week for Leading Forward, our summer speaker series, and it is about 
um, supply chains uh, and how they are going to change from one of our grads who is the principal thought leader at Amazon. So that should be fascinating um, given the state of the world today. Um, lastly, we just want a big grateful thank you. Um, I'm going to share the link with the guide. Um, you can also find it in the chat. Um, and we so appreciate your time. Feel free to get in touch and we hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much.